Broadcasting live from the North Fulton Business Radio X studio, it's time for To Your Health with Dr. Jim Morrow. To Your Health is brought to you by Morrow Family Medicine, an award-winning primary care practice, which brings the care back to health care. Hello, welcome to To Your Health with Dr. Jim Morrow. I am Jim Morrow, and this is episode 39. We're talking about the vaccination against the virus SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, in case you didn't know that. You've got the virus, you've got the disease. It's two separate things. One causes the other. But I'm very excited that you're here and you're listening. We really appreciate the comments that we get and that I've gotten here in the office and elsewhere. And it's just been very encouraging that people are listening and they want to hear what we have to say and that you really want to learn not just about this horrible pandemic, but about other things that we've been talking about. So once again today, today is August the 20, what is it, John? 26th. The big hand's in the way on my watch, can't see it. That's the 26th, August 26th, 2020. And uh, I am here in my office studio, which is just my office. But John, once again, in his home, in his very luxurious home studio, which has all the latest, greatest bells and whistles. How are you, John? I'm great. I've got a calendar on the wall, too. I had a calendar on the wall in 1978. I'm glad to know that you still have one. It's probably a 1978 calendar if you look at it closely. Um, John, it's been an an interesting six months, to say the very least. Uh, We started the year off right at the beginning of the year learning about this this virus, and we have learned so very much about it, and now here we are trying to make a vaccine for it in what is truly a record short amount of time. Uh, But one thing that people have been talking about a lot through the entire winter and spring and now the summer is one of the things that's very near and dear to my heart, which is college football. And I want to talk about my feelings about college football. Uh, You are welcome, anyone out there, to have your own feelings. These are mine. They might agree with yours. They might not. But the way I feel about it is this. If a college allows students to be on campus, I really can't see how they can justify not allowing football to be played or the other sports for that matter. The students who are not football players, not athletes, are going to be going to house parties and other parties and socializing in ways that are probably much more crowded and much more risky than the football players are likely to be. So I don't really see there's a great deal more risk than the other stu- than the football players or the other students. I see it being pretty much the same. Now, if a college does not allow students on campus, and you can reference the University of North Carolina, they decided this week or in the last week that they were not going to have students on campus. I don't see how they can let football players play because if they're not going to let students get together, you really can't justify just because of dollars letting the football players get together. And let's not fool ourselves. That's what drives this entire thing is money. But I I do think that if they're going to restrict students from being on campus, those students should include football players who are also students. Now, I do think that if colleges test enough, preferably daily, I think they're doing – twice a week at most, but I think they ought to test daily. And if they do that, then I think games could be safely played. But absolutely, every person who's going to be on that field should be tested the day of the game. I know the logistics about that could be quite interesting, and I don't know enough about all the logistics of that to really comment on it, except to say that I'm sure it would be hard. But I know the testing machine that we are implementing at Mara Family Medicine it, you could easily test everybody if you had enough of those machines. Now, those machines are not cheap, but these college athletic departments, especially in the Power Five schools, their pockets are incredibly deep. And I do think that they could afford to do this. And I think if they want to play football, they should be able to pull that off by doing more testing. The more testing you do, the better you're going to be and the more likely you are to be able to see that. I personally think they will start a college football season but it's going to be really interesting to see how much of a college football season we actually get to see. And John, uh, Slippery Rock, your school, how are y'all going to do this year? Uh, that's better than my real school. <laughs> I, in fact, 
I was think, looking at a cancellation of the season thinking, well, that way my school will be undefeated. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, if anybody doesn't know, I'm a Clemson Tiger fan, and I want to see Trevor Lawrence play a few more games. I'll settle for a few games, but I want to see that boy in a Clemson uniform a few more times. So uh, enough about that stuff. Let's talk about stuff that really matters. Some things I'm, go- I'm going to talk, as I said, about the vaccine for this virus. And in generalities, to make a vaccine, first you have to know what it is about this infectious agent, in this case a virus, that makes your body respond to it. What is it that makes you create antibodies? Well, with SARS-CoV-2, and again, that's the name of the virus, and just stop there for a second. In 2003, an infection came out, a virus emerged from the animal kingdom, and it was called SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was the disease it caused. So that was SARS-CoV coronavirus, and it was basically just called SARS. Well, this virus is very, very similar to that one. And so they called it SARS-CoV-2 because it's the second one. And that's where they got that name. Uh, The part that appears to be immunogenic that creates the immune response is this spike protein. If you've heard anybody talking about the virus, you've probably heard about the spike protein. That's the part, if you look at an electron micrograph of the virus, it's the part that gives it that corona, the crown-like appearance. It sticks out from the virus, and it's funny looking, and it's kind of strange. And every picture I've seen of it, it's red. I can promise you it's not really red, but it's red in these pictures, and so you can pick that out. When it attaches to your body, it creates proteins that are foreign, and those proteins are what cause the problems that you have from the infection. And I said on a previous episode talking about the virus that the virus itself injects its DNA into your cell, and your cell becomes the factory for these proteins and for more viruses. So that's how the whole thing works. The virus is not alive. It's not alive. You can't kill it. You can destroy it, but you can't kill it. And, but it can attack your body, and it's these proteins that cause the immune response and all the problems that you hear about. So if we could introduce just the spike protein into your body without the viral mechanism, then your body would create antibodies to this virus without getting an infection. Then if you're later exposed to the virus after that, you already have the antibodies in place. They attach to the spike protein, and they prevent the, the virus from attaching to the cell and causing infection. Now, that's a gross simplification of the process, but I think it makes the point. So up until now, the fastest we've ever been able to make a vaccine was a little bit over four years. That's a long time to wait for a coronavirus vaccine. And we have waited for years and years for some. Some have taken 10 years, some more. We've been trying to create a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus for 30 years and can't pull it off. And they've been trying to create an HIV vaccine since the late 80s, and they can't pull it off. So there's nothing easy about that. Now, all of the vaccine-related infrastructure, people that were working on this and that and the other vaccine, they are all working on coronavirus vaccine now. And the amount of money that's been put into this is just crazy. And because of that, the entire process will and really, I think, should be much faster for this vaccine. So right now, there are two main types of vaccines being developed. One is a brand new type of vaccine that's never been used before. It's called an mRNA vaccine. Now, the RNA, you know, the the, new, the genetic material in each of us people is DNA, and that's deoxyribonucleic acid. And there's another one called RNA or ribonucleic acid, and it's very similar, but it's different. And that's what's in this virus. So they're using this mRNA, which is messenger RNA, to try to create that vaccine to get it to introduce this protein so you can create antibodies and so forth. The other one is an adenovirus vaccine that is similar to many other vaccines that have been used in the past. This vaccine uses, incredibly enough, a chimpanzee common cold virus. And then they'll take elements of the coronavirus genome and insert it into that and give it. Now, that's one that has a lot of uh, favor in some people's eyes because 
the vaccines that have been made with this adenovirus backbone have been given very safely. So the only thing they're changing about that is the part of the virus to take out whatever virus was in it before, and they put this coronavirus genome in it so it creates antibodies against coronavirus. But the other part of the vaccine, the part that you might be concerned about being safe, has been used for years and has already been shown to be safe. So that's one thing people are thinking might make this be able to get to the finish line a little bit quicker. But in both cases, the vaccine will create proteins in the body that cause antibodies to be produced and recognize coronavirus. Now, if you develop antibodies to the coronavirus, they're not necessarily going to stay long term. But what happens is you actually activate white blood cells in your body called B cells. And these B cells will create these antibodies. And then later on, if you have a coronavirus infection, the B cells are activated they immediately create these antibodies, the antibody attacks the coronavirus, and you prevent infection. So why is it so hard for us to make these vaccines and other vaccines? Well, for one thing, people, humans, have never been previously exposed to this novel coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, and our, our bodies are really not well equipped to deal with being infected by that. And a vaccine would allow us to safely develop an immune response that we could use to create antibodies and control this infection. But it takes, it takes time, like I mentioned. And if, if we're thinking in realistic terms, not in political terms, I don't care about any of that. I care about the science behind this. I think realistically, a year from now, we'd be very fortunate to have a vaccine. I think it'd be very fortunate. I think by the end of the year, we may have the end of the phase three trials which means that the trials are finished, but then they've got to analyze the data and be sure things are safe. And then they have to produce a vaccine. And that's no simple task. If you think about the billions of doses that are going to be necessary, but it's, it's quick. It's becoming quicker to develop new vaccines and we're building on research from in the past. And so the process is being sped up. So that's really good. Now, the development of this new vaccine for the coronavirus is being partly led by experts that were already developing vaccines for other coronaviruses. Ever since SARS, we didn't really put a lot of effort into creating a SARS vaccine because SARS was a disease that people weren't really contagious until they were incredibly sick. So people who were in the hospital were the ones that were most contagious, and they were already isolated in the hospital. When they were walking around with a cough, they weren't contagious. But th this is quite the opposite with the coronavirus, too. And so people are walking around being contagious, but they've been able to take the knowledge and experience and the work that was done on the SARS vaccine and kind of move it towards SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So the fact that it was already ongoing has made it much easier for them to progress through these phases and I think that's going to make a big difference. The very first vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19, was developed by a U.S. company called Moderna Therapeutics. And there are about 35 other companies and academic institutions that are also working on COVID-19 vaccines. Most of these are in the preclinical testing and including one that's being developed by a team of researchers over in England at the University of Oxford. The vaccine candidate, which is what these are called, a vaccine after it's approved and licensed as a vaccine prior to that, it's a vaccine candidate. But the vaccine candidate was actually identified in January, right as soon as this thing came out, and it's nearing the clinical testing phase. Now, in the past, which should be a long time ago, and in this case, it really wasn't. It was months ago. Most studies of human viruses looked at how the virus altered or affected human cells in the lab, and the scientists first identify the proteins or even sugars on the surface of the viruses, and then they study whether these proteins can be used to generate an immune response. And like I said earlier, in this case, we found that it's the, the spike protein. But this whole thing has been made easier because researchers in China identified the genetic code of this virus and shared it with the world so that that whole step was, was skipped, basically. And it also enabled diagnostic testing kits to be developed, and it lets researchers identify 
other potential treatment options. So if you think about the timeline, the virus emerges from the animal kingdom on New Year's Eve 2019, a person's infected, and then in China, the infection grows pretty quickly. They identify that, they isolate this virus, and they pretty quickly had the genome written out so that it could be reproduced. And I think that by itself is an amazing feat. I mentioned earlier, I really appreciate people listening to these podcasts, and they are brought to you by Mara Family Medicine. Mara Family Medicine is a traditional family medicine practice with locations in Cumming, Georgia, and in Milton, Georgia. We are very proud to be one of the first primary care practices in the area that offer drive-through testing for coronavirus, and we're also one of the first to offer telemedicine visits in our area for both sick and well patients. We are currently seeing sick patients in our Milton office, and they're way too busy. And I'm I'm so sorry that so many people are out there being miserable, but they're just any number of them. And we're handling those in the Milton office. And I have to say my staff, I've just been thrilled to death with. They have been incredible in making this move to this new form of medicine that we're doing. And we're seeing well patients in our coming office. So if you have a physical blood pressure recheck, cholesterol, anything like that, you're going to be in the coming office, but if you're sick in most any way, we're going to be seeing you in our Milton office. We like to say at Mara Family Medicine that we're bringing care back to health care, and I think we've really shown that in recent months, and I'm incredibly proud of my providers and staff. If you have comments or questions about the podcast, you can reach us in two different ways. You can reach me at Dr. Jim, that's Dr. Jim at toyourhealth.md, or we are also on Twitter. We are at toyourhealthmd, and I would encourage everyone to to do that. I've been tickled with the number of people that have contacted me that way with comments and show ideas and that kind of thing, so keep that up and let us know that you're listening. So getting back to the vaccine for coronavirus, this process involves isolating the live virus before you inactivate it and weaken it, and then determine whether this modified virus, which is then the vaccine candidate, can produce immunity. So it's it's quite a process. And I I think about this, and, and it's amazing to me how people can do this when I'm listening to the podcast that I get most of my information from, which I'm happy to share with you, is This Week in Virology, or TWIV, as it's called, uh, Dr. Anthony Racaniello, who is a virologist in New Jersey at Columbia University in New York, a phenomenal virologist and great host. You ought to listen to TWIV anytime you get a chance. These people are always talking about how you just insert this and you insert that, and they make it sound so simple. And if you think about the size of the thing we're talking about, it's absolutely mind-blowing to me that they can do any of this thing. But sometimes they don't even use the live virus. I mentioned inactivating the virus, but sometimes they don't even use the live virus. Instead, they just take the genetic sequence and use that to make a vaccine. And we've been doing that for a while with flu vaccines, and it's also done that way with hepatitis B. So that's another type of vaccine that can be used. And researchers know now how to manufacture and test the relative vaccine candidates and check to be sure it's made properly. They even know about likely doses, and including how many doses will be needed to build immunity. And a lot of this is based on other SARS vaccines from the past that they were working on. So they've got a lot of information. So you, you get all these vaccine candidates, and then you've got to start testing. So you first go into preclinical testing. And preclinical testing is the initial safety testing, and this is usually carried out in animals to give you an idea of how humans will respond to it. And they're also used to be sure that the vaccine is going to be effective. And you see how you might need to change the vaccine to make it more effective or safer either way. And during an outbreak, different research groups often work together. People you would not expect in a non-pandemic world to work together. You can see them right now working together to speed this process up. And after the preclinical, you start clinical testing. And this is done in people. This is done in humans. And this is a step where many, 
not most probably, but many promising potential vaccine candidates fail. There's three phases to a clinical trial for vaccines. Phase one is testing on a few dozen, just a few dozen healthy volunteers to see how safe the vaccine is, to see if it has any adverse effects. That's all you're looking at is, is it safe? And it literally is in a few dozen people, 25, 30 people, something like that. Now, phase two testing costs the pharmaceutical companies a lot of money. And it's testing on several hundred people looking for efficacy. Does this vaccine work? Does it do what you want it to do? And you're looking at people, hopefully, in these trials who are those that are most at risk. You can't just do these trials on people who are 20 years old because they're not likely to have a bad outcome from the virus anyway. So you really, that makes it hard to figure out if they're uh, immune. But because this process of phase two costs so much and takes so much time, that's one of the reasons that vaccine development takes so long. So in steps the federal government, they, they create this program called Operation Warp Speed, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Warp Speed. This is a federally funded program to speed up the production of this vaccine. And what it does is it allows these companies to combine phases two and three because the government is going to bail them out if their vaccine turns out not to be safe or effective. So if they were to fail in phase two, they would have lost millions of dollars. The government is covering that, basically. And this is where a lot of vaccines die also. Uh, they that ends the loss of money for that company or the spending of money by that company. And, and a lot of vaccines end right there. But if the company can avoid that phase and combine it with phase three, they can save millions and cut months or even years off the development process. So that's why this is being a lot faster. So if you're a person who's considering whether or not to get the coronavirus vaccine, when it does become available, don't be thinking just because it was quick, it's not safe. That's not going to be the case. It's not going to be the case. So after phase two, or along with that, you do phase three, which is testing on several thousand, tens of thousands of people. Usually 25 or 30,000 people are used in phase three. And, and that's where you can see clearly if the vaccine is safe and effective. You can't tell it with a couple of dozen like you have in phase one. You got to go out to tens of thousands of people to be sure you're not missing anything that happens just once in a while. That's been kind of interesting to me that Russia has already released a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. And they did it without going through phase three at all. They're using the population as their phase three study. And that truly sets off all kinds of alarms in the scientific community. I hope it sets off alarms in this community and the people listening, and you will tell people about this. It's a terrible thing. That's not how this is supposed to be done. But uh, they do things a little differently over there, and we're not going to do it that way over here. If this vaccine comes out and is licensed, it's going to be something that the government has shown to be safe. The vaccine also, other than being safe, got to lead to a strong immune response. You want it to provide effective protection. And if you look at the FDA paperwork, the FDA licensure says that the virus has to be at least 51% effective. And you think, you think about that, you got to think, well, that's not very good. It's only cutting out half the cases. But if it's 51% effective, on people who are otherwise healthy and and not infected, when you see someone who is infected, then the history of vaccines tells us it's going to be much more effective in those people. But in order to bring it to market, it only has to be 51% effective. On occasion during an outbreak, a pandemic, experimental vaccines can be used without going through some of this testing through an emergency use authorization. We've not seen that right yet, and I don't think we're going to see that for SARS-CoV-2 and for this vaccine. But once the vaccine is licensed, it has to be produced. And there's that is no small feat. 
and the the factories that have to be made and the equipment that has to be created and the the processes and the software it, it takes quite some time and I firmly am of the belief that if we do get a vaccine that finishes the trial successfully by the end of the year it will take at least another 6 months for us to have this vaccine that we can use plus and I think then it'll be enough just for healthcare workers because that's who they say you're going to get it first uh, and if you're wondering, I'm going to be first in line to get mine. I don't, I'm not concerned about safety. If they license it, I believe it's going to be safe and I will be first in line to get mine. But then they've got to produce enough for everybody. And if you think just about the United States, we're in the neighborhood of 300 and something million people. That is a lot of vaccines. So it's going to, it's going to be quite a process. If any of these vaccine candidates are shown to be unsafe during these trials, then you just do a 180 and you go right back to the drawing board. And so it's, it's, it's quite a process. It's very elaborate. It is money consuming to say the very least, not to mention time consuming, although we are going to be able to cut some of that off, I think. And I, I think we'll have a vaccine for this virus, but I mainly hope that my patients and everybody will be willing to get the vaccine because that is the only way that we're going to pull ourselves out of this pandemic and away from these masks and shields and gowns and gloves and hand sanitizer. I'm so tired of and all of that. So I encourage you, please read about this, read about it in some scientific publication. Don't try to learn about this virus on Facebook and 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 make an honest decision and hopefully you'll decide to get this virus vaccine when it is available. And John, that's coronavirus vaccine. Wow. Excuse me, that was fascinating. So um you, what about all the folks and I there was some survey and I don't um remember the numbers, but a substantial number of people that um responded to a survey that said they would not get a COVID-19 vaccine. They didn't trust them. Well, I, that's very true. And I've seen those numbers. I've, and if you just look at the way people talk about it on social media, so many people say, I'm not getting a vaccine. And unfortunately, that's just ignorance. That's all it is. They just don't understand. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with ignorance. You can fix that. You can learn. You can teach. But that's just ignorance because they don't have all the information they need. And that's why I hope people will share a podcast like this or listen to TWIV or find something scientific to read and and learn about how this whole process is being done because I think it I think it's a good process. I think it is a safe process. And I don't believe for a second they're going to put out a vaccine Un, unless it is proven to be safe. So you, you can't make somebody do that. I've heard and read a few things about mandatory vaccines, and I don't see that as being the case. I don't think that's possible in the United States of America, uh, not before the November election at least. And I, I just hope people will be open-minded enough to learn about it before they make that decision. Now you mentioned uh, at at the uh, top of the show the uh, college football situation and getting tested, and that kind of brings up the question of what happened with the NBA, and they they apparently have been successful with a saliva test, and that just got I guess approved here a few days ago for more widespread usage. Um, Maybe and I may not have my facts straight, so I'm, no, I think you're right. Yeah. The, there are basically three types of tests in testing for the disease itself. There's the nasopharyngeal swab, which is like a brain biopsy, a swab that goes straight back in your nose about five inches, and it itches and is irritating, doesn't hurt. Had it done a couple of times, um, and then there's the nasal swab, which is just the and the front part of the nose the closest part of the nose and the nostril that's swabbed. And then there's a saliva test. And it, it looks like most of these tests are, are good. 
but they haven't all been approved by the FDA at the same time. And I think the saliva test was the very last one. But the saliva test to me has a, an awful lot of potential because it's very easy. I think it can be done in large numbers. If I'm correct in saying this, I think I am. The saliva tests are a little quicker than the long nasopharyngeal tests that you send out. But there's something important about the testing, too, and this may send us over time, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. The testing varies in how much virus it can pick up. So if you if you look at the test that's done at the hospital or one you send out to a reference lab like Quest or LabCorp, that test with a long pharyngeal, nasopharyngeal swab that goes back in your head, that can detect down to f- as, as few as five virus particles on that swab. And the test that we're going to be doing at Mara Family Medicine and other people doing the quicker tests measure, they're, they're positive down to more in the neighborhood of five or 10,000 virus particles. So it's not unheard of for someone to go get a hospital test or reference lab test with the long swab and it be positive. And then they say, I don't believe that. And then they go for a quick test and it's negative because the positive test is finding just a few little virus particles and the quick test doesn't pick those up. So it's negative. What's important about the test is that to understand that in order to be contagious, you've got to have at least a million virus particles that can be picked up by that swab. So if you only have five or 10,000, you're not contagious. Yes, the virus is there, but you're not contagious. So it's still a negative test in that situation is an appropriate result. So if you've had people that got positive and then negative, if they didn't have exactly the same test repeated, that could easily be why. Sorry about that. No, I think that's good. Um, uh, But I guess I was getting to your point about how testing can work for athletics successfully because it seems to be going fine for the NBA. Yeah, and I think it can, but mm-hmm. the NBA is, I don't know how often they're testing, but you know, they're in a bubble, quote unquote. In a well, bubble. that's true. Yes. And, and the, I think college football players could easily be in their own little bubble. I think it'd be easier to do that with college players than it would NFL players because mm-hmm. you can really manage them a little bit better. You have a little bit more control over them probably. But uh, the testing absolutely can can work to do this. You just have to test often enough. Right. So um, plasma treatments uh, for COVID, and we've heard a lot about that lately. Uh, What's the story on that? Well, what you're talking about is convalescent plasma. And convalescent plasma is plasma that's been taken from a patient who had a fairly severe infection with COVID-19 and plasma is the part of the blood. After you take their blood, you put it in a centrifuge tube, you spin it down, you get cells in the bottom and serum or plasma in the top. And that's also a gross simplification, but basically it's the part of the blood that doesn't have the red cells, but it has antibodies. And that's the important part. It has antibodies in it. So if you have someone that had a fairly severe infection with COVID-19, then they will have or should have a fairly large number of antibodies in their blood and therefore in their plasma. So with convalescent plasma, you take that from someone who is sick and you give that plasma IV, you infuse it into a patient who is currently sick with the virus in the hopes that the antibody will then boost their ability to fight off this infection. It's been shown very recently, the studies have come out showing that it just doesn't work well. Mm. And I think the reason it doesn't work well is because the infection with the virus is not the worst part of this disease. The infectious infection with the virus starts this process in your body called a cytokine response or a cytokine storm, which is where your immune system goes overboard and creates all these cells and fluids and things that accumulate in your lungs and make you sicker and sicker and sicker. And these things are what makes you sick. So by the time you would get convalescent plasma, really the infection part with the virus is in large part done and you're suffering from your own body's immune response to that infection. So it's been shown not to work really great. We thought it was going to be really good. And like so many things, it turns out it's not. You know, you talk like you've got an MD and like you've actually studied this. Um, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> well, right now I'm in my car about three hours a day. And for two of those hours, I'm listening to virus podcasts and the latest information and stuff. It's, it's very interesting to me, obviously, because I am a doctor, but also I think I mentioned on another show, I got a master's at Clemson in microbiology doing research in virology. And it's just really triggered a new interest in me or an old interest in me. Uh, for this kind of information. So I'm, I'm excited to learn it. I hate I'm having to, uh, but I'm glad the information's out there. And I just encourage people to stick to good sources of information because I think it's very important that if you're going to base a decision on something that needs to be scientific information, not something that Joe said at the 7-Eleven and you overheard him. Well, and understand what you, you've said previously, which is things change as people learn more. And absolutely. And that doesn't mean that it's a, uh, some sort of conspiracy or something like that, that w- we learn more as science goes along and, uh, uh, there's more research being done. Right. And, and many people have said to, to me and to others, well, y'all, you guys keep changing your mind. Well, it's called learning and we are changing our mind. We absolutely are. And we are changing our mind because we're learning that what we thought was true a month ago turns out is not well thanks for what you're doing well we are doing our best and we appreciate everyone's support and the fact that they'll let us try to help take care of them and uh i'm excited to to be doing the testing we're going to be doing at mara family medicine in milton uh coming up very soon so we're going to be expanding our services for this in the very near future in the milton office And John, I think that's what I've got for To Your Health.